Thanks. So our next presenter is Jessica Krantz, who's going to give us a presentation on the CHAOS program that's led by NOAA and funded by BOEM. Jessica? So Jessica, I'm going to pass you the, pass you the ball, and then you're going to share your screen, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So can everyone see that now? Not yet. Oh, yep, it just came up. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so, as mentioned, I'm going to be giving you guys a, a presentation on the results from the CHAOS project. And I believe that Catherine actually gave kind of a summary presentation a couple of conference calls ago. Uh, but I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail uh, about some of the components today. So the CHAOS project is the Chukchi Acoustics, Oceanography, and Zooplankton project. It was a five-year BOEM-funded study with the goal of documenting the distribution of large whales in areas of potential seismic activity and to relate their distribution to oceanographic conditions, indices of potential prey density, and anthropogenic activities. Uh, there are five main components to CHAOS, as the name implies. The first three are passive acoustics, oceanography, and zooplankton. Uh, but we also had a climate and a sea ice modeling component, as well as a Chuck Cheesy noise budget component. Um, and this talk today is going to focus on uh, these first three. And this is really one small aspect of this project. So if you guys have any questions on any of the other components or any other results, please feel free to, to get in touch with us afterwards, and we're happy to go into more detail. So uh, briefly, some methods. We deployed uh, clusters of biophysical moorings at 40, 70, and 110 miles off Icy Cape. And uh, during the field season, we did transecline sampling at all of the green dots there. We would deploy CTD casts and do zooplankton net tows. And then we also did marine mammal surveys using both visual and passive acoustic methods. And then for our analyses, uh, for the long-term data set, uh, for passive acoustics, we analyzed 100% uh, of the recordings manually for 12 species of marine mammals, both cetaceans and pinnipeds, uh, as well as for anthropogenic and environmental sources. We then used generalized additive models to correlate those marine mammal distribution data with oceanographic and environmental parameters, and that was executed in R. And then to determine if those correlations had positive or negative associations, we plotted those against eight different oceanographic variables. And then for our short-term data from our transect line sampling data, we plotted those with the marine mammal visual and acoustic results to try and get a, an ecosystem-based snapshot of what was happening in the Chukchi. So a little more detail on the GAM models. Uh, we focus on five resident or seasonally migrant Arctic species that serve as good sentinels for climate change based on their different dietary and ecological niches. We input 19 different oceanographic and environmental variables, and we ran the GAMs for all three locations for both years, which resulted in over 500,000 models. So now we'll go through the results. Um, kind of focusing one species at a time. So first with bowhead whales. Uh, this plot here represents the long-term passive acoustic data. It's the calling activity for bowhead whales. On the x-axis is time uh, spanning two years, September 2010 to September 2012. The y-axis is the calling activity, and that's presented as the percent of time intervals with calls per day. And then the plot is oriented geographically, with inshore at the bottom and offshore at the top. And the gray sections are no data. Uh, so in looking at bowhead calling activity, we were able to capture the fall and the spring migration in both years. Um, and interestingly, in the fall of 2010, we had a trimodal distribution in data. Um, and this coincides with what the natives see and likely represents different age and sex classes migrating through at different times. The spring data were mostly isolated to the inshore recorder, uh, likely just due to the migration patterns of bowheads as they use the near shore leads in the ice to migrate north to their summer feeding grounds. 
And then when you correlate those data with oceanographic data um, for the GAM results, both month and ice concentration were extremely significant, which not really all that surprising given the innate migration patterns of these animals. But interestingly, wind speed was also a significant factor in the GAMs. And so now we wanted to see if those correlations were positive or negative, so we plotted those uh, calling activity data with eight different oceanographic variables. And this is a very busy and colorful plot, so bear with me here. Um, each plot now represents one location. So in this case, it's the midshore location, 70 miles off Icy Cape. Um, and calling activity is now represented by the black line, and it's the same for all four rows. And each row, that calling activity is plotted against two different variables, and now the horizontal bars across the top represent no data. Uh, but since that's very busy and difficult to look at, we're just going to focus uh, one at a time on those parameters that actually had um, evident patterns. So for looking at, again, bowhead whale calling, um, you can see a strong association with ice, not only with concentration in blue, but in ice thickness in orange. And interestingly, all bowhead calling activity stopped once ice thickness reached about a half meter thick which is the maximum thickness uh, ice that bowheads can break through. Now when you look at wind speed in pink, there was a positive association in um, the fall of 2011 with wind speed. And so perhaps they're using wind speed as some kind of migratory cue uh, for them uh, to begin moving out of the area. Unfortunately, there were no bowheads seen or heard along our transect lines, so there are no short-term data to present. But in addition to the bowhead frequency modulated calls or their song, they also produce this impulsive call called the gunshot call, um, and we analyze that separately. So in looking at the gunshot calls, this is now the same plot of bowhead calling activity, but with gunshot calls overlaid in bright green. And you can see the gunshot calls almost always occurred at the peaks, at the end of the peak calling activity in bowhead whales. And when you compare those to oceanographic parameters, not surprisingly, since bowheads make it, the same variables are significant, month and ice concentration. Um, and when you look at long-term plots, you see not only the strong positive association with ice, but more specifically with ice formation. These calls always seem to occur when ice is forming, which leads us to believe that maybe they're using this call type to navigate through the calls or using the echoes bouncing off the ice to either survey the area or navigate through, or potentially to determine ice thickness, uh, which has been already suggested with their frequency modulated call. So moving on to belugas, looking at the long-term calling activity, um, similarly with bowheads, we were able to capture the fall and the spring migration, although most calls were isolated to the inshore recorder, um, likely because of the migration patterns. So in the fall, some animals will follow the coast of Alaska down south into the Bering Sea, while others choose to follow the slope far offshore and head down the western side of the Chukchi. And then in the spring, like bowheads, they use the nearshore leads in the ice to migrate back north. Although interestingly, we also got a bimodal distribution in data in the spring of both years. Um, and this is likely two different populations migrating through at different times, the eastern Chukchi and the eastern Beaufort population. And this is supports what's known from unpublished satellite tag data and acoustic data as well. So looking at the GAMs, um, similarly with bowheads, month temperature and ice concentration were again extremely significant, again likely because of the innate migration patterns. And then looking at the long-term plots, there was a positive association with ice, but also um, most notably with, uh, with the formation of polynias. Uh, unfortunately, no belugas were seen or heard during the field survey, so there are no short-term data for those species. Moving on to gray whales. Looking at the calling data, um, as you can see, there were very few acoustic detections of gray whales, uh, and those few that there, we did detect were almost uh, all isolated to the inshore recorder. Um, uh, aerial sighting data from Nimmel's Assam programs do show that most gray whales stay within about 25 to 30 miles of shore, and our inshore recorder is still 40 miles off the coast. So it's not really surprising that we didn't get that many detections. 
Unfortunately, because there were so few acoustic detections, the GAM results were inconclusive. But a few patterns do become evident with the long-term plots. Um, and just note here that the calling activity scale has been greatly reduced to, just to make those peaks a little more evident. So you can see looking at the plots, there's a strong negative association with ice. These animals are out of the area before ice arrives, and they don't start returning until after the ice is breaking up. There was also a slight association with chlorophyll, um, most notably here in the summer of 2012. And this can be seen as a proxy for primary productivity and so uh, for prey availability as well. Um, now, unlike with the bowheads and belugas, gray whales were seen um, frequently during our short-term surveys, the field surveys. And so those data are presented here. And looking at this plot, uh, this is all of our, this is a, the transect line data from, in this case, the Point Hope line. And starting at the top and working your way down, you've got the acoustic and visual results zooplankton data, temperature, salinity, nitrate, and ammonium. So when you look at this, you can see that the gray wells were always detected um, in areas of very high zooplankton concentration, as well as areas of high ammonium and nitrate levels. Um, this area, too, along Point Hope, is known for having a very high benthic biomass, and gray wells are seen in extremely high numbers here every year. And we have now had a, a long-term acoustic recorder at this location since 2012, and we just recently put a microcat at this location last year. Uh, and we're starting to go through those data now as well. So looking at walrus, uh, at the long-term calling activity, we had uh, strong summer peaks at the inshore and midshore locations. Uh, but interestingly, offshore, we had walrus detections nearly year-round with peaks in the spring, uh, which was really unexpected. You know, we thought these guys would be down in the Bering Sea. So it's possible that maybe these are some juvenile males that didn't migrate down into the Bering Sea for, for mating season. So when you combine those with oceanographic parameters, um, months and wind speed were highly significant, as were several proxies for prey availability. And when you look at the long-term plots, um, there was a strong negative association with ice um, and a slight positive association with proxies for prey availability, such as oxygen in purple and chlorophyll here in green. And these patterns were evident at the inshore and midshore location, but interestingly, there were no patterns evident at the offshore location, and that's where we had the calling year-round. So looking at the short-term transect line sampling data, uh, this case we're looking at the Wainwright line. Uh, walrus were seen in very high numbers in near Hannah Shoal, uh, which is also an area of high zooplankton concentrations, as well as some elevated ammonium and nitrate levels. And again, this area is also known for having extremely high benthic biomass, so it's not really surprising that we would see walrus there in high numbers, given that they are benthic specialist feeders. And again, they're seen in every year in high numbers at this location. Moving on to bearded seals, finally. Looking at the calling activity, uh, calling was ubiquitous at both, all locations for both years. Um, these guys chat a lot. They never shut up. And when our recorders lasted long enough, we did see a dramatic decrease in calling in summer, which coincides with the end of mating season. And when you relate those to oceanographic parameters, um, similarly with walrus, months and wind speed were highly significant, as were proxies for prey availability. And in looking at the long-term plots, there was a strong positive association with ice, but more interestingly with ice thickness seen here in orange. There were also uh, positive associations with proxies for prey availability, such as nitrate seen here in red. I'm looking at the short-term transect data for beardeds. This time we're looking at the icy cape line. And again, similar story with walrus. They were seen in high concentrations in areas of zooplank high zooplankton concentration, as well as high ammonium levels. And again, this area is known for having very high benthic biomass, and bearded seals are predominantly benthic feeders. So again, it's no great surprise that we're seeing them in high numbers at this location. 
So in summary, uh, we were able to correlate the marine mammal calling activity with both oceanographic variables and indices of prey availability using GAM models. But then by plotting those data, we were able to validate our GAM results as well as to determine whether those associations were positive or negative. And we plan to do more quantitative analyses in the future. And then by looking at the transect line sampling data and plotting those with the marine mammal survey data, that kind of gave us a, a snapshot of, of what's happening on an ecosystem-wide basis in the Chukchi. And now we're going to apply these same techniques and some new ones to a much larger data set. So moving forward from here, the CHAOS project has actually now branched into two different projects, the CHAOS X, which is a CHAOS extension study, and ARC West, which is the Arctic Whale Ecology Study. And both of these projects are five-year BOEM-funded multi-collaborative projects with three field seasons. We just wrapped up our last field season for these projects last year. But now we have moorings um, in a lot more locations spread throughout the entire Chukchi and Western Beaufort Sea. Um, and so we can actually, and, and now we can combine those with the chaos data to have a much larger time scale as well as a greater spatial scale. Uh, the main difference between these two projects is primary location. So the, the, the Chaos X, X project is focusing on those waters around Hannah Shoal, whereas the ArcWest study is looking at those waters that feed the Barrow Arch. And so by combining Chaos X, ArcWest, and the Chaos data sets, we hope to have a very large scale um, you know, data set that we can analyze and hopefully start answering some questions about what these animals will do as sea ice continues to change. Will they maintain their current behavioral patterns and migration patterns, or will we see a change in those based on or as, as sea ice continues to decline? So that was a very brief rundown of one small component of the CHAOS project. Um, and at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Jessica. That was a really great presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Hello, Jim Price here. Um, we, we were wondering um, what the range of the uh, hydrophones that were picking up the vocalizations are, and uh, was the situation complicated by um, uh, uh, the density of sea ice proximate to the hydrophones? Yeah, yeah. So, so we we estimate that our hydrophones will pick up marine mammals within um, roughly about 15 miles or so, um, and again that that's highly variable depending on any number of factors. Um, it is definitely uh, compounded by ice, um, although a, a complete cover of ice does actually aid uh, signal transmission. Unfortunately, it's very very noisy. <laughs> Um, and, and so a lot of times there is a lot of masking of signals when ice is particularly noisy, when it's really forming or cracking up. Um, but it, generally speaking, I, we think we're able to, to capture most of it without, without the ice interfering too much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Jenny from BOEA. I have a question on your ice concentration and winds. Are these from the numeric model? Uh, the winds were uh, from, yeah, I, I believe the winds were satellite data. The ice, we actually had ice profilers at each location. So technically, it's, it's, I think it's keel depth rather than exact thickness, but we were using just thickness as a, a proxy for it. But your ice concentration, that is also from the field measurement. Yeah, the ice concentration was satellite, I believe. The thickness was from the ice profiler. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any Hello. further questions for Jessica? Great, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, I 